します。Good morning from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett, Neurosurgical TV. Today we have the pleasure of having a, a master teacher of Vlad Bennett's, and I'll let him take it over. And welcome, Vlad, and thank you. Hello. Okay, it's all yours, Vlad. Thank you. So let me share the screen. Uh, uh, uh. All right. Does it work? Yes. John? Y yes, perfect. Very good. Okay, hello everyone. Be it afternoon, morning, evening, night, whatever. Uh, today I would like to talk about the meningiomas. And it will be like a compilation of several lectures. So you will first hear about the posterior fossa meningiomas. Then I will touch sphenoid wing and cell meningiomas. And all through the lecture, there will be some general rules which to follow and which would be like a, a teaching material for young people. Okay, we have two kinds of uh, surgeries in, uh, say, cell region, which is uh, like a most frequent target. And uh, there is vascular surgery, which virtually is subarachnoid, and we have uh, skull-based surgery, which virtually is extraarachnoid. It's aneurysms versus meningiomas. So take a look on this aneurysm. This is a simple ophthalmic aneurysm. And you do not see any arachnoid there since it's dissected away. You need to get into the subarachnoid space and then treat the aneurysm, dissect the aneurysm, dissect the neck, whatever you need. You see the optic nerve, you see the frontal lobe, and uh, you will see the roof of the orbit. And this is what you uh, are Ernest Neyme calls killing the aneurysm. So the aneurysm is killed. And you are in different space than in this. You see all the vessels here and you do not see any arachnoid. This is just the opposite. Simple tuberculum cell and meningioma. And you are outside arachnoid. See that the, I do not cut the arachnoid. I leave, I leave the arachnoid from the you are working in completely different space than, than in uh, vascular surgery. So these are the two main differences. Okay, let's now talk about the posterior fossa meningioma first. Keeping in mind that we are going to touch the arachnoid all the time. Over the years, we have a 224, and this is like teaching. I do not know about your place, but we are seeing more and more asymptomatic patients and they are difficult to decide. And these are the difficult from clinical point of view. Actually, the important uh, data is that you wouldn't operate on asymptomatic small tumor unless it grows. So prove the growth before any surgery. In diagnostic, it's T2 and T1 with gadolinium, of course, these two images are the important. You would like to evaluate the origin of the tumor, the relation to the surrounding structures, edema, cysts, CSF spaces, cleavage plane, vascular structures. And you do not see all this on T1 with Gado. This is the image for neuroradiologists so that they would not overlook the tumor. What you want to see is T2. You see the surrounding structures. You see the cleavage plane nicely. You see the edema, where it will be a little bit more difficult. You see the tumor origin over here. There are usually these concentric lines and they directly point you to the tumor origin. And you may guess that this part of the tumor will be hard and this part of the tumor will be soft. So all the information you need, you are getting from T2 images, not from T1. T2 are the surgical images. CTM, MRA, it's about the sinuses in uh, meningioma surgery. DSA, it's about the origin and about possible embolization, but mostly you want to evaluate sinuses. Check this typical tumor in the junction of transverse and uh, sigmoid sinus. It's occluded, so you would guess easy, complete surgery. Not true because there was a vein of lava coming from the front and entering the junction of the sinuses. So we had to leave these behind, despite the fact that I believe that the resection will be complete. Just the opposite way. The tumor in the same region, 
the dominant and the only transverse sinus, you would guess you would have to leave a piece behind, not through the tumor was easily resected uh, radically. So it means that you get the information, but the information may not be correct. You need to get to the place to realize what can be done and how it can be done. In these cases of uh, rectus sinus region, you sure would like to know what about the rectus sinus. If it's occluded, then you can achieve complete resection. If not, and you will see it later, you probably would like to leave a piece of the tumor behind as a plug of the rectus sinus because you are coming from opposite direction. The taxonomy of these tumors, it's uh, rather difficult and not uniform. You have this phenopetroclival, you have petroclival tumors, you have the tumors in CP angle, the junction tumors, some of the sinus, and you see that they overlap. So the taxonomy is sometimes it's difficult and it's difficult to point this is the petroclival tumor or this is the CP angle. Actually, the meningiomas, they form a group of tumors which really go one into the other. It's a continuum and usually it's along the sinuses because sinuses are the place where the majority of uh, cup cells are present and where the tumors grow. So the syndrome probably is this region of cavernous sinus and from there you can go in any direction and you will find a continuum of the tumor. You will find the tumor which overlap one to the other. Of course, this is the blind end. So these are the petroclival tumors. You see how heterogeneous group that is. Check this one. And these are CPA tumors. Check this one. Here, definitely the tumor origin is posterior to the nerve. So this is CP angle. Just the opposite here. Here, it, the tumor origin is anterior to the uh, nerve. So it's petroclival tumor, despite the fact that they look very much the same. What about the surgical strategies in these tumors? Planning, planning is everything. You really need to know what you are going to do, what you are going to encounter, what the tumor will look like. You need to choice, choose the proper approach. That's the most important part of your surgery. Most important part of surgery is prior to surgery itself. You would like to approach the tumor via the long tumor axis. So it's this two point technique, dura opening, arachnoid layers, tumor origin, attacking first, of course, as, you, as always. So it's a multifactorial process which you need to uh, evaluate well before surgery. There are two petroclival tumors. They look rather alike. However, they are completely different. This is the first one. See that at the end of the surgery, this is the third nerve, here is the fifth nerve, here is the rest of the tumor. The whole approach is supratentorial, uh, supracerebral, infratentorial only. And you just get the tumor easily from this approach. You do not need anything else. Unlike the other one, here it's before and here it's uh, the EMR after surgery. And you start high up again, infratentorial, supracerebral. And it's well seen that the tumor is still covered by the arachnoid. It means that it grows somewhere from the midline and somewhere from other place than here. The tumor origin will be elsewhere. So this was, then you go, Retrosic, resecting the upper part, now the lower part. This is the seventh, eighth nerve. I like to cover them with, a, with some glue because I believe that it's at least some protection because the manipulation at this uh, point uh, is quite a lot. So this covers, this protects the nerve at least a bit. And you need to go below these nerves. And meatus is the border between supra, infra, and between retrosic in my mind. And here is the last part of the tumor, the lowermost part, and now we are between seven, eight, and nine, then elevens, and it's virtually parlateral approach. The tumor origin is, this case was in a triangle between the seventh, eighth, sixth, and ninth, and elevens. Very unpleasant one. So this is something you need to know with, in advance. The same with venous drainage in these, what you can resect, where you can go. This is a nice humor which you can resect entirely. And we are going down to CC junction. 
there are several points which are important. First, the position to the side, and I have never seen the real uh, midline tumor where the spinal cord would be like a U-shaped posterior to the humor. So always the uh, far lateral or enough lateral approach is enough from one side. There is always predominance. See this, it looks like a midline tumor, but it still is a little bit to the left. So you will come from the left and you will read the whole tumor. Uh, there is the 12th nerve, which is the, the canalis uh, hypoglossy. Nervi hypoglossy is the uh, dangerous uh, location. You need to ascertain where it is. And then the vertebral artery. In general, those tumors which are below the vertebral artery are the easy ones. Those which are above the vertebral artery are more difficult ones because there are more nerves. What about the remnants and recurrences? It's the same individual evaluation as in the virgin case. It's exactly the same thing. But do consider other treatment options like radio surgery. Sometimes it's much better than uh, surgery. They definitely carry the higher risk of uh, surgery and higher risk of uh, recurrence. It's not a mistake to leave a piece of the tumor behind. See these two petroclival meningiomas. In both of them, I had to leave a piece of the tumor behind because there was not a cleavage plane between the uh, brainstem and the tumor. And you then follow the patients. In this case, the remnant didn't grow in eight years. In this case, the tumor grew, so it was treated by radio surgery, and now the patient is uh, stable and uh, symptom free. This is the case I told you about the rectus sinus that uh, you leave a piece behind, like a plug of the rectus sinus, because coming from posterior, you would be unable to uh, occlude the rectus sinus bleeding away from you. So it's better to leave a piece of tumor behind. What about the results and the implications of these posterior fossa tumors? Uh, there was 6% morbidity mortality rate, serious uh, morbidity mortality rate. And uh, usually, as everywhere, those are the patients who come with too much of a deficit too late. The patient coming in who is bedridden and who's got Glasgow coma scale like 7, 6, it's difficult to expect a good outcome. So there you recruit your uh, bad results. And uh, actually, I do not believe in lectures where you see zero in this uh, column. It's virtually impossible to be operating on these tumors without complications. And there is, of course, quite a lot of minor morbidity, which is usually caused by the uh, damage or manipulation of the cranial nerves. It's either temporary or permanent and uh, usually uh, doesn't really disturb the patient too much. What about the radicality in these regions in posterior fossa? 70% Simpson 1 and 2, and uh, that's something which is, uh, when one is careful and one is not overzealous to resect the tumor entirely, 70% uh, of radicality is like a good, good uh, result. Always the virgin tumors are much better, of course. And this is what uh, you come up with, that those tumors which are posterior to the nerves, they carry the low risk of surgery. On the other hand, those which are anterior to the nerves, they carry much higher risk of surgery. And it's statistically significant, this difficult difference. And of course, this carries something which you need to think about whether to operate or not. This was one of our unhappy cases. Everyone likes to be looking at the uh, failures of someone else. Uh, I might add that this was not my case. Uh, too much of a retraction in this simple, easy CPA tumor. And you see what happens. And despite the revision and uh, decompression, the patient died. It was one of our most un unsuccessful cases. This is another. The bad result, you see the tumor, which was perfectly resected. The patient was doing well for another three days. And then sudden deterioration with this bleeding in the opposite thalamus. And of course, the patient died. So there is the dangerous part where the tumor originates. And this is this region, which is bordered by posterior glenoid processes. 
entry to the Mecos cave, posterior rim of uh, internal meatus, posterior rim of jugular foramen, posterior rim of uh, 12th nerve canal, and anterior rim of the CC junction. So this is the difficult and then dangerous tumors arising from this area. And this area definitely matches the area of the basal cistern. Once the tumor has its origin in, let's say, prepontine cistern, there are the nerves which you may damage. Once the uh, tumor arises in, uh, say, prepontine cistern, you have to deal with basal artery and uh, perforators. And unfortunately, arachnoid in this region was not well defined. And arachnoid, as Imad Kanan is saying, is your friend. This is another region, but we shall get back to posterior fossa. But here it's well seen and well and easily understood. You see two cribriform plate tumors, exactly the same size, exactly the same location. However, this tumor has unilateral edema, this one bilateral edema. In this case, the anterior cerebral arteries are pushed to the other side. In this case, the anterior cerebral arteries are in the midline. What does it mean? In this case, where the edema is unilateral and the anterior cerebral arteries are pushed to the side, it means that this side is covered by three layers of arachnoid. And most likely, in this case, you will be able to preserve the olfactory nerve on the opposite side, and you will preserve some smelling for the patient. In this case, that's not true, because both frontal lobes are covered by single layer of arachnoid only, and it will be a surprise if you would be able to preserve the olfactory nerve. This is the case with small tumor coming from the side of the tumor. And you see that when you resect the last remnant of the tumor, you will see the contralateral olfactory nerve, which is well preserved, and the patient will keep the smelling. And this is the tumor origin in the midline, yet to the one side. If you check the textbooks, and the roton is the basics, of course, you do not see much about the arachnoid. The image I have shown you is the only one which really shows the arachnoid. Arachnoid was uh, not well studied in my mind. This is something we really must learn, and we really should know about the layers, about the systems, about the outer layers, about the inner layers, about everything. This is the only publication about arachnoid which is really exhaustive and covering all by Kuruc. It was done with endoscope, but you see the perfect images. It's some, there are two articles and they are somewhat difficult to follow because they are full of these images and just to get oriented is not that easy. So I have forced by one of my residents to work on arachnoid. Uh, she does it in tours and uh, uh, you see what nice images she gets with a specific technique of uh, dissection. And you really see all the arachnoid, you see all the structures. You may learn how the layers are composed, where the lily and quist membrane, where is the carotid system, which is probably the most important one in these surgeries. And those are really beautiful images. With other technique, you see that the third nerve is well covered by the arachnoid as related to edge of tentorium. So if you move here with your tentorial edge meningioma, you still have your sad nerve covered by a layer of arachnoid, which would help you to preserve the uh, nerve. The same thing, posterior anterior communicating artery covered by the nerve, not so the internal carotid, which is not always covered. In the posterior fossa, it's somewhat uh, tricky because the Arachnoid layers is uh, somewhat anterior to the fifth nerve and posterior to the seventh, eighth, and uh, ninth and eleventh. So if you have it here, you will know that there is an arachnoid layer which will protect the seventh, eighth against any manipulation you will be causing here in the region of the tumor. So the tumor is posterior to the nerves posterior to the seventh, eighth, and this layer of arachnoid will be the border of your dissection. You shouldn't pass through. So planning the approach with advanced knowledge of 
systems and expected arachnoid layers. It's a little tricky, but it's uh, very helpful and it really uh, is the thing which uh, you should think about it before any surgery. And of course, the exact tumor origin must be defined because where the tumor starts, there is the system where the tumor is located. And in this, the T2 helps you with all those signs which are pointing directly to the point of origin. They are not always seen, but in many tumors, you see them well. So in conclusion, for posterior fossa, those tumors which are posterior to the nerves go for surgery, which are anterior, think individually. For those who are beginning the surgeries, who are the residents of the first, second year, this should be your first posterior fossa meningioma and this should be your last posterior for some meningioma after many many years of training let's go to the uh, cell region to sphenoid wing uh, again the textbooks uh, might not be very helpful see that uh, this is declared as pterional approach that's not pterional approach in my mind this is uh, subtemporal approach frontal lateral approach okay these are rather large and with lots of temporal bone exposed, which is not necessary for cell region. You do not go that far back. This is all the approach which I have abandoned some 20 years ago, and I don't find it helpful at all in any of uh, surgeries. Because where you need it is when you need to go high up, let's say in basal artery aneurysm, which is higher up than the posterior. Posterior glinoids more than 15 millimeters, and uh, all these uh, things are now done by endovascular people. High up located uh, craniopharyngioma. Now you handle lots of them through the nose by endoscopic surgery. So, all the approaches, uh, in my mind, outdated. What you need and what we do, it's a perianal approach, and I always ask the resident either for frontal deviation or for temporal deviation, depending on the tumor or on the lesion I want to attack. And uh, finally, it's usually like frontal lateral approach. The most frequently one gets there along the upper surface of the wing. It means frontal lateral. So frontal base, some three millimeters is perfect. I'm not a big friend of this keyhole or eyebrow surgeries. I've tried that and I don't like the orthograde side. So we are doing usually the regular craniotomies. All these are not used in my practice. And when we are going to the cell region, which is most frequent target, it's really the wing which is important and anterior clinoid, clinoid process as its uh, uh, end. And there is always some relation to the Ring. And definitely, there is the carotid system, which is the most helpful space. First, you release the CSF from there, and it's the most effective uh, CSF release uh, from any basal systems. And then you move either outside or inside this system quite frequently. So, what about the anterior clinoid process uh, meningiomas, which are like a uh, final target of, of uh, this surgery. They tend to grow upwards, most of them. If they are smaller, they are more middle, and then they cause the symptomatology from the second nerve. They, in my mind, they almost always attack optic canal. So almost always I open the canal just to check whether there is the piece of the tumor or not. And of course, it helps you with your manipulation there. And there is the arachnoid within the optic canal, again covering the optic nerve. So there is the layer which helps you protect the important structures. On the other hand, not always at the beginning of the internal carotid artery, as it enters the dural space, there is the arachnoid. And uh, meningiomas tend to be somehow invasive when they get out. So this is the point of origin of many disasters that you may injure carotid artery. There are two tumors. It's anterior versus posterior clinoid, which uh, look alike on the AP view. They look completely different on a, uh, the axial view. You see that this one, which is anterior clinoid, is in front of the arteries, in front of the important structures. 
just the opposite. This one is posterior to the arteries, posterior to all the structures. And these, fortunately, not that frequent. Those are rare tumors. Those are the difficult ones. Again, the result there were we have had like 280 of uh, sphenoid wing meningiomas, and again we had five percent of uh, complications or deaths. That's uh, almost unavoidable again, and again some temporary or permanent small deficits. What were the causes of these disasters? In uh, these, those were injuries to carotid artery, as I told you, at the, its entry. To the into the dual space and perforators. Then again, these too much too late patients coming in with major deficit and decreased uh, Glasgow coma, and then some technical errors. Minor morbidity it was unilateral vision decrease, diplopia, mild hemiparesis, uh, most of it cleared over the next year or two. And you see that again, those are the tumors which differ quite a lot from cavernous sinus down to the external part of the wing, but still it's a continuum from this tumor to these tumors. You wouldn't find a cut when you would say this is this one or this is that one. One of our disasters again, everyone likes to see it. You see the simple outer wing meningioma in a 70 year old guy and there was the infection after the surgery which we were unable to fight and the patient died some 35 days after the surgery. You always get to this point, or most frequently you get to this point. And these are the difficult but the most interesting tumors in supratentorial region along with tuberculum cellae. And there are three kinds of them. One of them is like lateral to the carotid, directly at the tip of the, uh, the clinoid process. This one may be large, may be growing, quite uh, long. This one produces the uh, symptom latigy area. This is the tumor which is located in between the carotid artery and the uh, optic nerve. And then there is the type which is medial to the optic nerve. And this one also you will get as a small one because it causes the visual deficit quite early. So these one are these are larger, larger, these are smaller. Check now where the third nerve is. Third nerve is just behind the corner when you get on the temporal side of the dura of uh, clinoid process. That's the first structure which you may hit there and you may injure in this region. And this is by far the most difficult uh, region in the human body from anatomical point of view. So let's see these three tumors now on uh, videos. This is the first variation, the lateral one at the tip of the uh, clinoid process. It's a female with visual deficit coming in, no remarkable history. This is her tumor, not really the largest one of these anterior clinoid tumors, but uh, medium size. And the approach is always the same, resecting the wind, going down to the uh, uh, orbitomeningeal uh, band, which you coagulate and cut. Then I would find uh, easier to get the plane between the cavernous sinus and the outer layer of dura. It's much easier to find it on the temporal side of the sphenoid wing, not directly when the, where the band is. I always look for the layer over here and then go back to the band again. And what I do, that, uh, that that's probably the lesson from uh, ophthalmic aneurysms, that I do not really resect the entire clinoid process from extradural approach. I leave a tip of the clinoid process where the tumor origin is in place. I just break it free and then I resect the remnant uh, at the end uh, during the uh, intradural phase. You see that uh, find the plane between the cavernous sinus and temporal dura is easier on the temporal side, not directly where the band is. Of course, the next step is to open the uh, optic canal and open it widely. 
and you actually are getting to the tumor origin or tumor invasion of the optic canal very early in your surgery and you may get as deep as uh, bottom of the optical strut which is now you see where is that the optic nerve is quite higher than your resection and then again the dissection of the uh, cavernous sinus dura the dura opening itself might not be a large one the small opening is sufficient because you will all the time be working very close it's a short distance to the anterior clinoid if the wing is resected and now we are already there i'm sorry for these videos i got a new new editing program at the time when i was doing them and uh, it was a bitch for me this is the sylvian fissure being opened to get the top of the tumor again you might preserve all the structures there you do not need to cut anything uh, extensively just the minimal approach is sufficient and this in my mind is minimal invasivity you need to be minimal invasive in relation to the lesion not in relation to the approach the minimal invasivity must be executed where the tumor is or where your target uh, of your surgery is not at your approach it's not really important whether the uh, skin incision is three or five centimeters it doesn't make any difference now i'm looking for the top of the tumor there will middle cerebral artery appear for a while and then when the tumor is somewhat free i just undercut it this is cutting the outer ring and you would like to finish your cut where the temporal slope begins because if you cut through then you might injure the third nerve which is directly beneath this dura now we are already we have the um, temporal part or uh, lateral part of the tumor is now free and you just continue cutting the dura uh, the outer ring to the optic nerve then you will cut the lower ring just undercutting the whole tumor Sometimes it's tricky to find the uh, uh, carotid artery, which is usually enveloped by the tumor. So this is the uh, part of surgery when you must be free. And you see, this is the tip of the clinoid process, which I have left behind. And I will only resect it now when I know that the tumor, bone, and carotid artery are not that uh, attached at that, that I will not injure the carotid artery which is here and now the tumor is nearly undercut but the whole bulk of the tumor is still in place you see that the arachnoid is preserved not cut through the arachnoid still covers my third nerve over here which I don't like to injure it still covers the uncus which is not really that important structure but you do not want to injure it anyway and cause some bleeding which might prolong your surgery and now i'm looking for the optic nerve which is over here and then again cutting the dura of the base of the uh, uh, clinoid process and opening the optic canal sufficiently to get the whole tumor you see this is the dura and I'm cutting back to the optic nerve uh, with the pressure of the tumor on the optic nerve. It's uh, somewhat surprising that the optic nerve runs nearly horizontally in this, this region. It's not going away from you. It really traverses your field of vision sometimes. You see the optic nerve is over here. It's not running like that. It's running like that to the optic canal. And when you cut the last piece of dura the tumor is completely free of the surrounding tissue and now it may be resected entirely the optic nerve over here and now we see already the the liberated optic nerve the tumor is not on the screen but it is there here's the carotid artery and you will see at the end that all the structures will be covered by arachnoid like you see here the optic is covered you may use cusack cusack is an excellent uh, 
instrument for uh, decreasing the size of the tumor and sometimes it's really very helpful in dissection on uh, I call it passive mode that you are just touching the tumor and uh, detaching it by resection from the surrounding tissue and uh, it's it's really a helpful thing and now the whole tumor is resected I just want to show you the structures after the tumor resection that there really is nothing damaged and all the uh, structures are virtually covered by arachnoid at least by its own arachnoid not probably by the outer but from the inner, inner one and you see this is the optic a1 carotid middle cerebral here is the olfactory nerve, this is the Hoidner's artery, and everything is well preserved. So let's go further. This is the MR after the surgery. The vision improved. There was a partial set nerve puzzle which improved over the next uh, three weeks. There is another one, the medial part where, uh, between the carotid and the uh, optic nerve. There's a female visual deficit appeared during pregnancy. That's quite frequent that pregnancy is the uh, trigger point for symptomatology in meningiomas. And this is a small one, a little bit medial, more medial than the first one. And here's the video, which I promise you is shorter than the first one. You see the optic nerve quite early and you see that the tumor is underneath the optic nerve, not on the side of the optic nerve as in the first case. And now you just will peel the arachnoid. I just am trying to preserve this tiny vessel. And then the tumor is virtually between the optic nerve and the carotid artery. Again, the same cutting of outer ring. Here you do not need to get that laterally as in the first case, which caused uh, then the set nerve palsy. In this case, this was not necessary. So the patient didn't have any palsy and any problem. Now we shall focus. It's again my new editing program, which is not really. What about the retractors? I, I believe that when you, when you want to use them and when you feel it's important, okay, why not? It's uh, not a dogma not to use retractors. In most of the cases, you, you get by without them, you do not need them, but sometimes it's good to retract the brain a bit just to get some space. You see again the, the, the uh, well, doesn't matter. Let's go forward. Here it's after surgery. Uh, back, back to the retractors. Uh, in many cases, I put them in uh, just to protect the brain again against myself. If you need to drill, in supracerebral infratendral approach, the petros apex, then it's far from your side and you may injure the cerebellum just by inserting the, the, the drill into the surgical field. So it's better to have a, um, uh, the retractor there which protects the brain against yourself and it's the same thing sometimes in these cases. This is the patient after the surgery vision return to normal. And this is the third case, uh, which is the most medial one, medial to the optic nerve. You see that the tumor is very small, but it caused uh, vision uh, disturbance. You might want to use navigation where you, when you are resecting your uh, clinoid process. And it's again the same, the tip of the clinoid process resected when we are already intradural, you see that the dural opening in this case is very limited. And then again, cutting through the outer ring down to the lower ring or inner ring, whatever you would like to call it. It's uh, somewhat confusing in the literature. And you do not see any structure at the beginning because the tumor is medial to the optic nerve, covering the optic nerve. And in this case, it was uh, rather uh, strange because the tumor was above the optic nerve in the optic canal and below the optic nerve. So uh, the optic nerve was virtually enveloped by the yeah. tumor and 
of course the patient had some uh, minor deterioration of vision after the surgery which improved over three days and in three days, three days after surgery she was able to count the fingers and when she came to outpatient visit three months after surgery her vision returned to normal. You see the carotid, you see the tumor which is above the carotid and in between the optic nerve and carotid. And now we are going to get to the optic nerve, which still it's not, it's still carotid artery. And this is the piece of the tumor or part of the tumor which is covering the optic nerve. Now you see the optic nerve which is nearly flattened in between the tumor nodules. Some more drilling through the optic canal just to get well in front of the tumor which uh, entered the optic canal quite a lot in this case. And then resecting the tumor from the lateral side of the uh, optic nerve. Now the funny part will come, which I have left behind. I tore some artery there. I didn't know which artery it was. I occluded it by a clip. At one point I thought it may be even a carotid artery because you see the bleeding is quite brisk. Then I thought about the ophthalmic artery, but it probably was neither. What the origin of this bleeding was, I do not know, but we did get by. Now we are lateral to the optic nerve. You see the flattened optic nerve, and this is the piece of the tumor which is in the optic canal. And we shall get back to the medial part again after we I resect this. This is the clip which now holds, holds nothing. And you see the thin and flattened optic nerve, carotid artery. And there was something which bled, which I do not know what was it, but it didn't bleed anymore. So the optic nerve virtually is here in the free space, but still the arachnoid of the region is preserved. Okay, this is just the CT after what the anterior clinoid resection looked like. And this is the MR after the surgery and the patient three days later, counting the fingers and doing well. So tips and tricks, terrional rather than frontolateral only because you would like to have more flexibility in your approach, more angles, which is important, not only one angle. Detach, remove anterior clinoid extraurally. But most frequently, I resect the tip of the clinoid intradural by intradural way. Stay extra carotid, that's important. Open dura from medial to medial of uh, second nerve to the tip of the anterior clinoid. I'm talking about the rings. Cut them. Ascertain where the tumor origin is. Do understand where is really the tumor origin because it's important. That are the tumor. Open the canal sufficiently. So let's go to tuberculum cellae, define the tumor, devascularize the tumor, decompress the tumor, and retard the tumor. It's the simple thing. Here is again the video about lifting the arachnoid, which I will skip. And here we are when the tumor is undercut, detached from the tuberculum. This is the opposite uh, optic nerve, opposite side carotid artery, ipsilateral optic nerve, and lateral to it is the ipsilateral. Uh, carotid, and you see how free of blood or devoid of blood the tumor is. It looks like like piece of gel foam, and you can easily resect it. You can easily dissect it from the uh, frontal lobe and from hypothalamus. There is usually the thick arachnoid which really holds the tumor, so it's, it's not that difficult. What is difficult, and what I'm, I find uh, like a not a mistake, there are many, many uh, uh, discussions about it. Whether you should uh, attack these tumors from ipsilateral side or from uh, contralateral. You see the end of surgery of this uh, tuberculum cell and meningioma. This is the ipsilateral optic nerve which we see and the tumor origin is below this optic nerve. And it's rather difficult to deal with this unless you manipulate with the optic nerve quite extensively. So I really do not like to have the tumor origin 
on my side. So what I do, you see, you, you may attack it between the carotid and the optic, but still the manipulation with the optic nerve is uh, quite uh, severe. So I always check the images. Most of these tumors are really slightly preponderant to one side. So this one is slightly more to the left. Thus, I will attack it from the right and check what it looks like. This is the opposite optic nerve. This is the ipsilateral. This is the opposite side carotid artery. Here, the tumor is very adherent to the optic apparatus. So I had to cut it sharply. Fortunately, this didn't cause any visual problems. And now we well see the tumor origin, which is on the opposite side. And that is also the part where you want to drill your uh, optic canal. So you drill it from medial side, directly where the tumor origin was. And you have excellent control of any remnant of the uh, tumor within the canal, which you hardly have when you come from the ipsilateral side. You see that this is the medial point of the optic nerve, and there is the tumor, tumor remnant. So this is the contralateral carotid artery, contralateral optic nerve, ipsilateral optic nerve, ipsilateral carotid artery. You wouldn't be able to do it from the ipsilateral side. You see, this is the last remnant of the tumor being resected from the optic canal. So this is my opinion, and I'm not uh, forcing it like dogma, but uh, I always am happy with the uh, contralateral approach. Again, just going when we are talking on, on meningiomas in general, I will hit the parasagittal and the uh, central region uh, meningiomas very shortly. This is exactly the same thing as I have shown you in uh, olfactory group meningioma. Should this be a motor strip and should the tumor origin be a little in front of the motor strip, then the sulcus will protect the motor region the two arachnoid layers within the sulcus will be your border of resection protecting the motor strip against any injury. So again, this is the evaluation of the tumor before surgery that you know whether you are dealing with this situation or with this unhappy situation, which fortunately is pretty rare. And this is the dangerous situation. <laughs> See how the tumor grows. This is the a huge parasitical and when you resect it you have three possibilities here the tumor was just adjacent to the arachnoid and you preserve the brain entirely here it was adherent and you see that you preserve the vessels you preserve the uh, cortex and you do not damage anything still you damage the arachnoid of the region and this is where is the dangerous part where the tumor penetrated arachnoid and where it was really dangerous to resect it. So take home messages to make it shorter because I'm talking too long by now. The taxonomy of meningiomas depends on uh, tumor origin. As easy as that, and that is how all the classifications uh, should uh, deal with them. And that is where the confusion in the literature starts. Appreciate arachnoid layers. That's important, and that's what uh, Imad Khanan is saying that arachnoid is your friend, and it's really a very friendly structure in your surgeries. Remnant is better than deficit. Remnant may be either resected later or followed or treated by radio surgery. So, remnant is really better than deficit because deficit quite frequently is permanent. In elderly and asymptomatic patients, prove the growth before surgery. Don't operate on ungrowing meningiomas. I have quite a few of meningiomas which I never have operated and patients are coming on uh, regular visits once in three, once in five years and doing well. Consider other treatment modalities. Don't be just a surgeon, be a physician and uh, appreciate that there are uh, radiosurgical means, that there is even the, the regular radiation whatever other modalities, and do please consider observation <clears throat> as the regular treatment uh, modality. That's what the other modalities taught us.
And this is Prague in the winter. Now it's, uh, it looks without snow, still beautiful city. And I thank you for your attention. Okay, okay, Vlad, thank you. Uh, Ike, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Ike. Hey, Vlad. Hi, hello. Hey, good talk as usual, Vlad. Excellent. I, if I learn one thing, it's about the tuberculum cellar meningiomas uh, to go from the chondrolite to... Speak up, Ike. Speak into the microphone. Uh, 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 uh. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's better. Yes. Much better? Yeah, you're getting an echo, I do have something else open there. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. My God, I'm seeing uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Diyupujari. He looks like one of those uh, yes. shippers. Hi, <laughs> hi. That's what lockdown can do to you. <laughs> you look better. Hi, Vlad. Hi. Great to see you. Great to see you, uh, too. I so, think you should keep this. It looks very good on you. <laughs> <laughs> My wife always uh, doesn't agree with it, so it will be out soon. I think we'll be starting work next week. Uh, one question I had, Vlad, I, I missed a little bit uh, earlier part of uh, uh, your talk, but in spinoid being meningioma, uh, the Let's let's go from um, uh, your last part of the talk, and then I will ask the second question. You you talked about your preference for uh, contralateral view when the tumor uh, is covering the optic nerve, ipsilateral optic nerve. The main main reason my proponents of uh, you know craniotomy versus transnasal approach talk about is the tumor lateral to the optic nerve on the ipsilateral side. Uh, is, is that uh, a problem if you come from the opposite side? It's, it's not. Uh, it's, uh, this is really an unsolved issue. Uh, we just have published the position paper on uh, cell meningiomas in ACTA. And mm -hmm. this was one of the questions which we have posed there. And uh, we never ever arrived at uh, some conclusion. So. Chandra Sekar, this is my personal preference to come from the other side. I feel more comfortable and I feel safer. And this is just opposite to olfactory groove meningiomas, which I attack from ipsilateral side. So this is something <laughs> which is uh, questionable. No, and uh, I believe that this is up, up to up to the surgeon, which uh, the approach. The reason to ask you is, is it is it uh, uh, good enough to drill off the optic canal can can you expose the optic canal well yes 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 you can because you can unroof the canal and then you can drill the medial uh, side of the medial wall of the canal and you really can uh, expose the optic nerve the same way as you expose it from the its lateral side with that addition that you see the medial uh, wall of the uh, optic nerve that's uh, in my mind uh, profitable. More, yeah, it's more likely the medial side is involved than the lateral side for the kind of tumors which we operate from the contralateral. Exactly, side. exactly. The other question in is cellar, in cellar in cellar meningioma. This is not the case for clinoid meningioma, yeah. of course. We're talking yeah. of mainly like tuberculum cellae or anterior clinoidal meningiomas. Uh, yeah, if I understand you correctly. The second question I have is. Uh, when when you have large tumors in this area, small tumors we are okay. Uh, how frequently have you found that uh, the tumor has involved the adventitia at least, if not the whole uh, artery, the carotid and the uh, carotid bifurcation? Uh, that's a that's a that's a good question, Chandra Sekar. Quite frequently, quite frequently. This is what uh, Sama Mefti uh, was first to describe. Uh, and there really is uh, like two or three millimeters of the artery, carotid artery, which is uh, devoid of arachnoid. Right. And, uh, I don't know if you have the same experience. Once the meningioma is outside dura, it's yeah. rather invasive tumor. And right. here in this place, the tumor has opportunity to go into the wall of the carotid artery. 
So that's exactly the point when I'm really extremely cautious and when I'm tempted to leave a piece of the humor behind. And uh, I have I have torn twice uh, the carotid artery, just being overzealous in this region, exactly and in this region. And I believe this is experience with everyone. Whoever deals with larger tumors do that. Not the small ones, they are fine, but the larger do that. You are right. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. That I thought was an important uh, point. That's an important point. Very important. Ibrahim, you may please ask the question. Thank you. Uh, hello, Vladimir, and hello. Hello, Ibrahim. Good to see you again. Good to see you. And hello to Aib and Chandra Shekhar. Uh, I really enjoyed your lecture. And Thank you. Uh, I call this a mission impossible. A mission impossible because you cannot uh, cover the main points of every meningioma as you described, but you succeeded in this mission impossible. So thank you very much indeed. I just want to stress on some of the points you mentioned. And one important point is the value of the anatomy knowledge. I believe that we are not teaching our residents the importance of the anatomy because most of the residents read from green book uh, handbook and the green book would not teach you anatomy. What teaches you anatomy is rotum or something similar to that. So this is important because people believe, especially in this part of the world, that reading Greenberg, you have done your job and you know the anatomy, you don't. So this is a very important point that you mentioned and you showed so many pictures from rotum, which is, is valuable. The other point, which you also uh, evaluated and you mentioned it in, in Frank, is the taxonomy, the terminology of these meningiomas. People don't differentiate between sphenoid wing meningioma, medial lateral sphenocavernous, sphenoorbital, whatever. They just lump some of them as, as, as sphenoid wing meningioma. And the same thing with the posterior fossa meningioma. Sabrinopin mm -hmm. meningioma is the same like Petroclimb, it's the not. So people need to know this, and you, you made the point in, in that direction. Uh, the point regarding radiosurgery, uh, I'm against the idea that people are coming up with recently of debulking the tumor and then give radiosurgery, simply because they cannot do the surgery. I believe gamma knife radiosurgery is a valuable instrument, but put it in the hands of mediocre surgeons, then they will come up with the crazy ideas of treating everything up front with radiation or go and take a small biopsy and treat it with radiation. This is very important for the young generation to know. Uh, lastly, about the drilling. I believe uh, the drilling of the anterior clinoid, the drilling of the sphenoid wing, the drilling of the supramatal ridge is, uh, is something important and it is something that should be in the domain of every average general in neurosurgery. It is not only in the domain of skull-based surgery. It's something that they can learn, something they can master, and something we can use. Once again, I thank you very much indeed. Ibrahim, thank you. The, the, those were important points you made. You know, I, I just remember it was uh, Ghazi Ashargil always saying anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. Once we had a dinner with him in uh, London and he complained about the meat, that the meat is not cut properly as it should be cut his beef steak. And there was a voice from the audience he said, anatomy, 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 you know, and that's really <laughs> what I remember and what stuck yeah. to me that anatomy is important, yeah. Uh, the, the, another point you made about the drilling, certainly, you, you must drill. And uh, other, other modalities, I like radio surgery, it's uh, just fine in many tumors and in many uh, instances. On the other hand, surgery still is the fastest, most precise, and most effective. Absolutely. So in young, uh, I would uh, subject a patient with, uh, say, glinoid meningioma, who is 70, I would freely send him to, 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 to uh, gamma knife. But uh, in a patient who is 30, 34, I wouldn't like it, you know, because I, I just mentioned that the uh, recurrences are extremely risky for surgery. We, neither of us likes that, you know, and they really carry high risk. So if you can treat the tumor properly at first surgery, it's always the best. Okay. And that uh, is related to your point about the drilling. Uh, I believe that in all these tumors, you should drill the optic canal 
just to check it whether the humor is there or not. Not just coagulate the dura. Really drill, open, and resect. Thank Absolutely. you, Ibrahim. Thank you, Dan. You, you had probably one more question which I didn't answer, didn't you? No, no, you, you've covered them all. So thank you again. Thank you, Ibrahim. Vlad, uh, on yes. the anterolateral uh, corridor, I mean, especially the sphenoid being anterior clinoid, tuberculum cellae, large meningiomas, I would like to make a few points. I usually, I do the orbitomeningeal band dissection, just like you showed uh, first. I op open the orbitomeningeal band, I completely unlock the temporal lobe. And after that, I drill, I completely drill the anterior clinoid off. I drill off the uh, planum and uh, extradurally you can go up. I mean, extradurally you can even drill the opposite optic nerve. So the opposite op up to the opposite optic nerve, you can go. The only thing is the ethmoid bands and uh, you will have to, when you take off the ethmoid bands, then you may have anosmia on that side. This is the only problem. But if it's a large tumor, it's always space to see the extradural carotid and extradural optic nerve and then open the sheet there first so that you know where the carotid and the optic nerve is. So that is what I do. So I, instead of opening and then finding a clump of tumor and being unsure about the optic nerve till the very end, I open from where the optic nerve and uh, I open from where the optic nerve and the carotid is and then start my decompression. So, yeah. but as you said, uh, obviously there is, there are tumors. I mean, I never used to believe this, frankly. I, uh, there are tumors where the carotid cannot be really taken out. So once I have the proximal carotid, uh, the vertical carotid, once I take off the strut and everything, once I have the carotid, and once I have the carotid bifurcation, I know this tumor, I can chart out, we can easily chart out the carotid because we're not going blind. But even then, sometimes, as you said, the tumor just cannot be separated. Some tumors, very, very few. And if we try to go ahead with, uh, you know, with separating it, you are going to create a tear. And that, um, <clears throat> this is something- I know you, I, uh, I, I know you are uh, extremely good at the, these uh, extra neural drillings and that, uh, you love it and that, that, that you propose it all the time. I'm not against that, you know, but uh, what I'm afraid of uh, in this area that I will open the sphenoid uh, sinus and then the uh, CSF leak might be a trouble for several weeks and months, just several reduced surgeries. So I'm, I'm always careful to stay outside the sphenoid sinus. And if you are uh, doing such an extensive drilling, it's almost, uh, there is always the danger that you will open it. So yes, absolutely. If I, I, I'm doing this in Europe most likely, whenever necessary. Yeah, absolutely. We put a temporal muscle plug. I mean, many times we open the sinus, as you said, we open into the sinus, we yeah. take a temporalis muscle plug and... Uh, sure, sure, you, you, you may treat it, but... Uh, I, I've had several patients where we fought with CSF, you know, and that, that was really big, 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 big deal. I had a young lady, you know, she was like uh, 29. She had a uh, tuberculum cellar meningioma, which uh, appeared after a pregnancy as usual or as quite frequently. And I wanted to do it really as radical as possible. And I entered the sphenoid sinus. I can tell you that there were like... Uh, two or three transphenoidal surgeries with endoscope, twice I came from above, and the last surgery I came from above again, and I was unable to recognize where the optic nerves are, where the carotid arteries are, and that, that was really something. So I'm really af afraid of this. Yes, Ibrahim, please. Yeah, I have a question to, for Chandra. Can you hear me, Chandra? Yes, yes, Ibrahim. Yeah. I just want to ask, can you do uh, 360 degrees optic canal drilling using the endoscope from below? No, no. I think uh, uh, what uh, Vlad also just uh, confirmed is that in most of the tumors, usually I wouldn't operate on a tumor which is beyond 3 to 3.5 centimeters from the endonasal approach. And I wouldn't operate on a patient uh, whose 
tumor has crossed uh, uh, the carotid or even the optic nerve uh, laterally. Any tumor going lateral to the optic nerve and uh, 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 carotid mainstem, I, I am not very keen to do it uh, endonasally. No. But yes, uh, if you have a tumor which is reasonably soft, which turns uh, you know, reasonably white on T2 weighted images, and if I see that uh, the bulk of the tumor is uh, on the medial side of the carotid and the optic uh, nerve, I, I'm happy to do it endonasally. Yeah. Uh, most of the studies um, published about the incidence of optic canal involvement by these tuberculin cell angioma shows you that the majority, they have some extension of the tumor into the canal. And I agree with Vlad that one should drill the optic canal in all the cases, regardless, even if you don't see it on the preoperative images. So what I, my, I, point I, is, my point is, uh, Chandra, that if one wants to achieve Simpson grade one, then it is best done from above by a craniotomy rather than from Indonesia. <laughs> I don't uh, fully agree with you. Uh, I think you can do a 270 degree decompression of the optic canal uh, by Indonesian approach. My objection to calling Simpson grade zero to transcranial uh, is that you are coagulating the dura. You are not excising the dura most of the times. While if, when you come endonasally, you always take off, you always take off the dura to which the tumor is attached. So you are more likely to have a uh, Simpson grade zero from endonasal than uh, transcranial. But the point about uh, taking the dura, we don't coagulate the dura. Coagulating the dura is Simpson grade two. So it is essential to achieve Simpson grade one is to take the dura and drill the bone and even enter into the sphenoid sinus, if the case may be, because you want to achieve Simpson grade one. Right, so having a hole in the uh, sphenoid from above is probably worse than having it. <laughs> Maybe, yes. <laughs> what's the proportion, Chandra? What's the, what's the pro <laughs> proportion of tuberculum tumors which you do endonasally and which you do transcranially? Uh, right, I think uh, this is, uh, I can't say specifically for tuberculum cellae, but about uh, 84 cases we have done of anterior cranial fossa meningiomas, and we have done 14 of them endonasally and rest of them I mean, almost 71 of them uh, have been done uh, uh, transcranially. Mm. So it's, it's a small proportion. Yeah. It's about 20%, I would say. Right. When we started with endonasal, we were enthused about the meningiomas. So we, we were doing uh, them quite frequently. But uh, slowly, the number of endonasal procedures for tuberculosis meningioma decreased. And now we are doing all of them transcranially <clears throat> again. The second reason also why it has decreased is because of the loss of olfaction. If the patient has intact olfaction, then again, we give them a choice not to go transcranial rather than endonasal. Yeah. Well, if the vessels are encased, uh, if you have any doubt about the vessels being encased, how much ever good you are in endonasal no, when, no. You have, when you when it is a heartbreak. I mean, you Absolutely. probably can use an endonasal long cusa and maybe... You may be lucky to, you know, uh, take off all the tumor from the vessels, but if the vessels are encased, this will be an absolute no-no. I've seen some of these guys proposing endonasal. It's a beautiful approach. You're taking off the blood supply in the beginning and all that. But if the vessels are encased, I think it's a very, very bad approach. Uh, it's a heartbreak for the surgeon. It's much more peaceful going ahead from top. Uh, drilling whatever and taking it off rather than, you know, uh, going blind. And if there is a bleeding, then you're done for. You don't know, you know, you, you completely... Yeah, that's exactly what Chandra has said, that uh, as long as the, the tumor is small and between the arteries and the nerves, yeah. then uh, endonasal is extraordinarily beautiful. But as yeah. soon as it's lateral, oh, yes. th th then it becomes uh, almost sure. impossible. Yeah, but there's a lot of guys, you must know that there's a lot of guys proposing, you know, the problem with a lot of uh, people that I see is uh, if you have a hammer, everything looks to you like a nail. So if you are, uh, you are uh, <laughs> That's it. with just one approach, and I, see, I see guys going through the nose for jugular foramen. I'm not joking. I, I tell you, there are guys going through the through the nose to the jugular foramen where, where I can do a mastoidectomy and get to the jugular foramen with this much distance. Mm -hmm. I see guys going lateral to the cavernous sinus and staging it endonasally as grade 5. 
I mean, I don't understand why you should have a grade five when it's so easy to go for a trigeminal schwannoma from laterally. I don't understand why you should go endonasally, cross the cranial nerves, cross the carotid, and open lateral to the carotid and do that. I mean, you know, there you are. Said that, I, you said that that's a hammer and the nail. You have a hammer, so everything looks like a nail. That's why they are doing this. Yeah, so you, mean, you must have some sane people like uh, Chandra who does both. So, you know, and that is how the young people should be guided instead of thinking that you could even reach the rectum by the nose. And, uh, you know, you. No, that no is you cannot. Way. You can reach it by supracerebral in front and <laughs> Well, I think uh, more and more techniques are coming up and uh, more and more training, uh, uh, you know, workshops keep on happening. People get enthused to do something. And uh, I think to have that balance is really, really important. And I, I think uh, your whole lecture today probably shows that quite well. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you so Ibrahim, Chandra, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, very good. I guess we'll wrap up, right, Ed? Unless there's something else anyone wants to say. Okay, we look forward to uh, another one tomorrow, Vlad. Right? What, what's the topic tomorrow? Yeah, uh, that's something I really like. That that, that will be about the, the uh, vascular surgery or neurovascular surgery, which we have left to the others. Great. Great. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> Great. Okay, we'll see everybody tomorrow. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, John. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.